The most effective way to reverse insulin resistance is with the elimination of carbohydrates or the restriction of carbohydrates. And I tell them that if you just go and say, I'm eating a whole real food diet, doctors are going to say, great. But if you tell them you're eating a carnivore diet, they're going to lose their minds and, and say you're killing yourself. Despite the evidence in front of them, we've reversed your diabetes. We've reversed your high blood pressure. You lost all this weight. The vast majority of your cardiovascular markers show improvement. Because you say you're eating a lot of red meat and maybe because your LDL cholesterol has gone up, most doctors are going to try and discourage you from doing what has led to all that improvement. And that's the very problematic situation that I see with my patients these days. Welcome to another episode of Born Unstoppable. In this episode, I talked to Dr. Ovedia, who is a cardiac surgeon in Florida, author of the book, Stay Off My Operating Table, and host of his own podcast. In this episode, we discuss the five markers of metabolic health, what blood work he orders for his patients, what diet he recommends, and we also talk about cholesterol, the difference between LDL, ApoB, and LP little a. And we discussed insulin resistance and how checking your fasting insulin can be a great Great way of assessing insulin resistance years before it takes place and more. Enjoy the episode. Before this podcast starts, I have a small favor to ask of you. Over the last couple of episodes, over 97% of people watching these videos did not subscribe to the channel. My goal is to reduce that to 50% one day. And if you've ever liked anything on this channel, please do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button, like the videos and share it. It helps this channel a lot more than you know. Thank you and enjoy the episode. I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my role as a family medicine resident at the University of Toronto at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Barrie. And I may cover topics that aren't fully aligned with the CPSO, our governing body of physicians here in Ontario. It is, however, part of my desire to bring awareness and information as it relates to improving health and other aspects of life at a zero cost to the general. Hi, Dr. F uh, Philip Ovedia. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. Uh, like we were just briefly mentioning or chatting about, I've been looking forward to this. I have listened to so many of your podcasts, and I think our listeners, both our listeners, will benefit a lot uh, from this. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me as a guest, Chiago. It's great to be here with you. Uh, I really applaud your um, doing this as a medical student and the, the, the curiosity that goes into this. So really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, it's definitely a, a challenge being a resident in family medicine. Not too many people are fond of maybe this topic or they're not really aware of nutrition um, as a prevention or at least our approach to, to nutrition, but it is something that more and more people are catching on. And I think it's so helpful to have this information shared for free online for the podcast and also uh, in your book, if people want to get a deeper dive into it. So would you mind just um, introducing yourself, kind of giving the background, what and how you got to the place of where you are? Sure thing. So um, I have been a cardiac surgeon, a heart surgeon now for uh, 20 years. And during much of that time, I was a very unhealthy heart surgeon. I had reached a point that I was morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic. And I realized that I was going to end up on my own operating table, so to speak. Um, I was traveling down the same path that so many of my patients had followed. And like so many of them, I really didn't know what to do about it because I was following the advice that I had been educated to give, um, you know, the advice that we've all heard, eat less, move more, um, you know, uh, follow the dietary guidelines, uh, eat a low fat diet. And it wasn't working for me and it wasn't working for my patients. So, you know, I started asking some different questions. I got exposed to some different information. And ultimately, I figured out, first of all, how to overcome my own health challenges. Uh, lost 100 pounds, have been able to maintain that weight loss, um, you know, reverse my prediabetes. And I came to understand that we were taking the wrong approach to heart disease, that the disease that I had dedicated my career uh, to treating um, we weren't really doing a very good job with it. And a lot of the, you know, kind of dogma that I had been educated on uh, was not quite the whole story. 
So um, that has kind of led me to uh, add an additional focus to my career. I continue to work as a cardiac surgeon, uh, but I also now am passionate about helping people prevent heart disease. And uh, that's what uh, led me to write my book, Stay Off My Operating Table. Uh, and now I also run a uh, telemedicine practice uh, that helps people to prevent the need for heart surgery. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, like so many people, often that personal journey is what ignites uh, the curiosity to kind of look beyond the boundaries that are typically established, beyond typical guidelines or what we conventional medicine knows. Um, how did you find the time? As a cardiac surgeon, which I can only imagine how busy you are doing that day in, day out, how did you find the time to, to research what, how to change your nutrition, how to experiment, and how did you go about that? Yeah, definitely a challenge. And uh, time is one component of that challenge. And quite frankly, you know, uh, coming across the information that isn't uh, the mainstream, that isn't really promoted and uh, actively taught. Uh, is another challenge. Uh, Time-wise, you know, I, I think it's like anything else. When you're passionate about something and when you are mission-driven and realize it needs to be a priority, you you figure out the time. Um, and yes, you know, being a cardiac surgeon is a very busy life. Uh, but, you know, when we were first talking about my own health um, and then later talking about how to uh, more effectively help my patients, you know, those, those became the priority. And so you, you find the time, mm. uh, to do those things and, um, and, and, you know, you overcome those challenges. And like I said, those challenges are not only dedicating the time, uh, but really being able to admit that, um, you may have been wrong about some things, uh, being able to admit that yeah. maybe you didn't you know, learn all that you needed to learn uh, in school and, and during your training. Uh, those are some of, I think, the characteristics, some of the qualities that are necessary to really make a significant shift in, uh, you know, in your professional life and in your personal life. Yeah, um, I agree. When the pain gets so, so, uh, so strong, you find the time to really uh, study this and implement in your life. And I like it for you too. You also have your patients in the back of your mind. Like how can not only you help yourself, but, uh, help your patients. And in that, like, was that transition was shifting from a typical cardiac surgeon schedule to this new way of seeing, uh, nutrition and preventative medicine. Was it challenging to make that shift? Um, kind of, I know mentally it was challenging, as you said, you had to admit that you were wrong and kind of acknowledge that and re reframe a lot of the things that you learned as you learn new information. But practically, how would that shift your practice in a big way? Or was it pretty easy just to pivot and continue? No, it, it has been a major shift. Uh, so I left my uh, employed position and I had been, you know, employed by hospital systems for my entire career. I left the sort of comfort of that and uh, went out on my own, started doing, uh, you know, what we call locums work or travel work. Uh, and then, um, you know, really ended up actually establishing uh, two separate businesses on my own, one to kind of do the um, travel and contract uh, work that I now do for cardiac surgery and the other to start a telemedicine practice. Um, and I had never run a practice, you know, I had always been employed. Uh, so that, that's uh -huh. been a, uh, challenge and a, a, a growth, uh, area as well. And, uh, quite frankly, I, I have found that pursuit to be very rewarding. And I Good. really do wish that doctors, uh, as a whole would get back to, uh, running their own practices, being in business for themselves. Uh, rather than the shift that we've seen over the past 20 to 30 years uh, that has resulted in the vast majority of doctors. Uh, and this is certainly true in the U.S. and, of course, even more so true in Canada, uh, that we're all, you know, employees either of a health system or the government uh, or, you know, some entity. And we are not 
the businessmen, the entrepreneurs that doctors used to be. Yeah. And that's, that's a big change. You went from being employed to being an entrepreneur. And I know a lot of doctors are afraid of that here, right? Because they just don't, they don't want to have to worry about the money, the business. They just want to focus on the patient, which I get it. It's one less thing to worry about. You just do the work. At, at the same time, there's a little bit more control that you get if you are an entrepreneur in terms of how you run your, your clinic. And so there's pros and cons to everything. But that definitely you you made a big shift in your life and your career and so uh that just shows how how much more dedicated you were to to fleshing out that that path so one of the big things that you talk about is metabolic health um mm -hmm. what what is metabolic health and how does it why does it matter in, in cardiac health yeah, so the the simple explanation I typically give for metabolic health is when we are metabolically healthy, our bodies are able to properly utilize the inputs that we're giving it. And the primary input that we give our body is the food that we eat. And when we eat, you know, one of three things is supposed to happen to that food. Uh, some of it gets immediately turned into energy uh, to be, you know, used to fuel all of the activities that are going on in our body. Some of it gets broken down into its components, and those components are then used to build and rebuild tissue, uh, another process that's always going on within our bodies. And then some of it gets turned into energy and put into storage for later use. Um, for the, you know, almost for really the vast majority of our existence as human beings, food was a scarce resource, and we had to deal with times when food and energy wasn't available. Our modern environment has largely solved that problem, but it's created a new problem where we end up storing too much energy and we don't have a chance to utilize that energy. And that then has a whole host of downstream consequences uh, that lead to other problems. One of those problems being cardiovascular disease. And, you know, for uh, the practitioners that are in your audience and, and the uh, you know, uh, scientists that are in your audience, this really comes down to a um, biochemical process that we know as insulin resistance. Uh, so insulin is one of our master hormones that helps control um, energy distribution in our body. And when that system breaks, um, you know, it has severe consequences uh, throughout our bodies, and it can show up in many different ways. Uh, and most of the chronic diseases that we now spend our time as physicians treating, things like cardiovascular disease, many forms of cancer, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, these all have a shared root cause, common root cause in insulin resistance. So what mm -hmm. I came to recognize, you know, is that our approach to cardiovascular disease, which largely ignores insulin resistance and metabolic health um, is inadequate and has been inadequate. And that's why I believe that cardiovascular disease has remained the number one killer uh, for so many years. You know, here in the United States, every year since the 1950s, heart disease has been the number one killer. Right. And um, I agree, like, insulin resistance is so prevalent yet we don't have we're not using the most effective tools we have to catch it early uh something that i would pitch there is like a fasting insulin which i know we we don't do unless i think that's more of an endocrinologist uh biomarker to order at least here in canada and if a patient wants it then i, th I believe they have to pay out of pocket so while we're talking about insulin resistance and we you just mentioned what metabolic health is, do you want to go through the criteria that you use to really define uh, metabolic health so people are aware and can kind of, if they know their numbers, they can put themselves in into those numbers. And also, once you mention them, I can give the Canadian version of the lab values. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. Um, happy to do that. And uh, I'll, I'll preface this by saying you can also just go to my website, ifixhearts.com right on the front page, free quiz that will take you through these numbers uh, and tell you where you stand from a okay. metabolic health okay. standpoint. And these criteria are well accepted. They're not my criteria. They uh, 
They are the criteria that we use in medicine to diagnose um, the metabolic syndrome uh, is what we call it. Uh, so five basic criteria. And again, I'll emphasize these are the basic criteria. I agree with you. Something like a fasting insulin level um, is an excellent uh, tool that should be checked routinely, but it's not actually part of the standard criteria. So the standard criteria look at your waist circumference. Uh, this is something you measure at home. You take the tape measure. You go just above the level, level of your belly button. Um, uh, measure it first thing in the morning before you've eaten. If you're a man, you want that to be uh, less than 40 inches. If you're a woman, you want it to be less than 35 inches. And um, I believe that's uh, maybe 120 and 100 centimeters, respectively, something like that. Um, okay. Yeah. So I always uh, forget I, all the conversions. I didn't, I didn't cover those ones, actually. <laughs> Yeah, we will we'll do that real quick and, and put it in the notes there where, where it say it out loud. But uh, the next measurement you're going to look at is yeah. your blood pressure. Uh, you want your blood pressure to be less than 130 over 85. So both of those numbers need to be below those cutoffs. And that needs to be without the use of medication. If you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, if you've been started on medication to lower your blood pressure, that is an indicator that you are not in optimal metabolic health. The other three measures are going to come from some basic blood work. And again, this is blood work that most doctors do on a routine basis. They just don't tend to look at it in the context of metabolic health. So we're going to start with your fasting blood glucose level. Uh, and you want your blood glucose level, the amount of sugar in your blood when you haven't eaten for about 8 to 12 hours, that should be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And I think that's five millimole in, um, in uh, Canadian and European uh, units. Uh, again, without the use of medication, if you've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, uh, another indicator that you are not metabolically healthy. And then we're going to look at your cholesterol panel. But we're not looking at the LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol that your doctor probably focused on. We're going to look at two other numbers, um, the um, HDL cholesterol, what your doctor may refer to as good cholesterol. And we actually want that to be higher. That's confusing to many people because all they've heard is lower your cholesterol. HDL, you want it to be higher. If you're a man... Uh, you want that to be over 40 milligrams per deciliter. If you're a woman, you want it to be over 50 milligrams per deciliter. And um, you probably have the numbers there in millimoles. Yeah, so 40 would be above one for men, and then for women, it'd be above 1.3. Very good. And then uh, the final number we're going to look at is your triglycerides. Uh, this is another you know, uh, cholesterol carrying particle, uh, cholesterol, another component of our cholesterol test. It's, it's not actually a cholesterol ca carrying molecule. Uh, and we can get into some of that nuance later if we want, but this, you do want to be lower. You want it to be less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Yeah. And, and so in our units here to be less than 1.7. Yeah. So, you know, you look at those five measures. If three or more of those are outside the healthy range that we talked about, uh, you actually are diagnosed with the metabolic syndrome. And the metabolic syndrome means that you're at high risk for a lot of those chronic diseases that I mentioned before diabetes, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, and in fact, many mental health diagnoses have now been linked with. The metabolic syndrome. Um, one mm. or two of those being abnormal is kind of a warning sign because we know that people tend to progress as they get older uh, to the metabolic syndrome. And the statistics around this are actually pretty scary. Uh, here in the US, a study that came out uh, back in 2019, looking at 2016 data, showed that only 12% of the adults in the United States can meet all five criteria of optimal metabolic health. So in other words, 88%, wow. almost nine out of 10 of us are not in optimal metabolic health. And uh, again, that is uh, 
an underlying root cause reason for all of these other chronic diseases that we see and focus on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard of that study. I mean, Canada w- would be probably similar. Um, so just kind of going through some of these, I'd love to kind of um, a little bit more detail. For example, if we start with hypertension, mm-hmm. you said that ideally you want it below 130 over 85. Uh, I think the guidelines here in Canada are still about less than 140 over 90. And I know kind of depending um, on the demographic, it'd be lower. but it, Typically, a little bit below 140 is good. And then what are factors that contribute to hypertension? Um, And what have you observed moves the needle the most in some of your patients? Yeah. So um, again, in the vast majority of cases, um, hypertension, high blood pressure is related to insulin resistance and poor metabolic health. Um, and it's a, it's really oftentimes the first sign of metabolic health issues. And unfortunately, within the medical system, um, we don't do a good job of recognizing that. We, we see that the patient has high blood pressure and we prescribe a medication to treat the high blood pressure and bring the blood pressure down. And those medications are effective uh, and have shown to have, you know, they have benefits. Um, but they don't change the underlying problem. And, you know, because we don't address the root cause, that root cause persists and then can lead to other problems down the line. So, you know, uh, again, the statistics are very clear that people who have high blood pressure are at higher risk of later developing things like diabetes and heart disease and uh, chronic kidney disease and, and a lot of these other associated conditions. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I think it's a big missed opportunity uh, when we first diagnose our patients with high blood pressure uh, to not just use medications, but to look for insulin resistance and then address it. And the most effective way to treat insulin resistance, especially in its early stages, is with changes in our diet and lifestyle. Um, And, you know, in fact, the the same diet and lifestyle changes have been shown to be as, if not more effective at treating high blood pressure than the medications are. It's just that the medications are easy um, and diet and lifestyle may not be as easy uh, to Mm -hmm. prescribe as a physician and to, you know, implement as a patient. Uh, And that, that is the challenge uh, but again, that's where the huge opportunity lies, because what I have found with my patients um, is that when you do educate them and you do take the time to explain this to them and you really give them the option of, I can prescribe you a medication for your high blood pressure. It will bring your blood pressure down. Um, but over time, you're likely going to require more and more medication and you're going to be prone to developing these other problems. Or we can work together on changing what you eat and how you live, and we can truly reverse the problem. You won't need medication for the rest of your life, and you can avoid a lot of these other downstream problems. And when you educate patients in that way, almost always they say, tell me what to eat, tell me how to live, I'll make those changes. And largely they're successful in making that change. Uh, But Mm -hmm. when we don't present that to the patients. When we really say medications are the only option, uh, we're doing our patients a large disservice. Yeah. And I would, I would say that the nuance there, I guess, is that the patients that come to you self-select. So they're more willing already to make some changes. Whereas some of the patients that I see in the family clinic, right, we have free healthcare. So it's a wide variety. And um, depending on their their social determinants of health, their background and financial status, they are the ones that would most likely just go to the medication or they just can't afford the healthy food. And I struggle with that one because I know that patients would benefit so much by changing their diet. But I, if I tell them, you know, increase your red meat intake, that's, that's so expensive. Um, it's hard for me to afford some, some of the healthy cuts. Right. And, um, but it's important to, as a practitioner, uh, 
be able to lay out those options and let the patient choose. And that's what I, I try to do in my daily practice. Yeah. And I, I don't deny that. Um, and I do see both sides of it because again, you know, I am still a practicing heart surgeon and I see patients who come for heart surgery and then, you know, we're having right. similar conversations. Uh, those are unselected. Um, and I do recognize the challenges. Um, but uh, you know, those challenges can be overcome. Uh, uh what I consider to be a healthy diet, which is based in whole real food, um, you know, animal products, plant products can be done, uh, you know, at a very cost efficient manner. Um, there are some, you know, realities, some nuances that, you know, we need to explain to the patients um, that, yes, you know, the red meat um, is going to cost more than the box of processed food. Um, but you know, in the end, you end up eating less when you're on a nutrient dense diet. Yep. Uh, most of my patients end up eating less often. So again, you know, the patient is there thinking, well, I eat, you know, five or six times a day. I can't eat red meat five or six times a day. Uh, but the reality is, is that when you're eating, you know, a nutrient dense animal, uh, based diet, you usually only eat once or twice a day because that's all you're hungry for. Uh, there's a lot less waste yeah. I find with these uh, um, with these dietary approaches, and you know, quite frankly, it can be done. Um, it may not be as ideal, uh, but you know, you can use the very inexpensive, um, you know, meats that you can find, and a lot of these meats are you know very inexpensive and very affordable, and so there are ways to do it. You know, eggs are another great tool that when you really mm. break down the cost. Uh, per kind of uh, unit of nutrition, uh, the nutrients that it's providing, um, you know, uh, it turns out that animal products turn out to be very cost effective. And then there are other yeah. factors that go into it. You know, the cost of being on these medications. And, you know, I realize in Canada, socialized medicine, you know, there largely aren't those same medication costs, but that is a re very real consideration here in the U.S., a lot of these medications are very expensive. And if I can get patients off, you know, a medication like insulin, I can save them a lot of real money that can then be, you know, redirected towards healthier food. Uh, and we are largely successful in doing that. Um, and then there's, you know, quite frankly, just the cost of being sick. Uh, and that's a harder one to get people to recognize. But again, I think it is a very real consideration. That, yeah, maybe you spend a little bit more on the food today, but you save a lot of money on healthcare costs in the future. Uh, and again, that's a little bit harder yeah. for the person sitting in front of you at that moment to recognize. But when we're looking at this from a healthcare system perspective, I believe that that's a very important consideration that we should be looking at. Yeah. The uh, just to. Uh... Uh, tell you about the medication so we don't get free medication i think above 65 do and maybe below 25 and then everything else is typically covered by health insurance like benefits and then if you just don't have it then you pay for it um, right. so we do also have to consider prices some some patients come back and like ah, i can't afford the medication unless then we gotta adjust um so going continuing on the hypertension kind of trail one thing i was wondering do you check homocysteine levels yeah, I do routinely check it. I think it's a very important uh, and under-recognized risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And I do routinely check homocysteine levels and not uncommonly find them to be elevated in the patients who are coming to me that already have, you know, established cardiovascular disease. And again, an opportunity that mm -hmm. simple interventions uh, some very inexpensive uh, supplements uh, can can take care of that problem and, um, you know, uh, re significantly reduce risk of cardiovascular disease. It's another test I put on my list that we really should be checking routinely and we don't. Yeah. Do you find that patients who have like uh, genetic hypertension tend to have elevated homocysteine levels? And what supplements do you recommend to bring those down? 
Yeah, so I think it is an important component. Uh, I haven't really looked at hypertension in particular, but certainly when you look at cardiovascular disease in general, um, you know, and what we end up calling idiopathic uh, because or essential hypertension because we haven't found a a, a cause. Um, homocysteine oftentimes is a component that, if it's checked, yes, it's oftentimes abnormal. And uh, like I said, fairly simple to uh, reverse, uh, usually supplementing with methylated uh, folate and methylated B vitamins um, is going to bring down the homocysteine uh, in uh, most cases. Sometimes there are some other um, factors that you have to get into, but you know, I always start with methylated folate, methylated uh, B vitamins, and uh, those are Mo- mostly effective in bringing down homocysteine levels. Um, and again, okay. you know, in my practice, this is in the context of making the dietary and lifestyle changes. So it's hard to separate out, uh, you know, how much is the supplements themselves versus the other changes that we're making. Uh, but, uh, you know, mm-hmm. it, it turns out that the genetic mutations, uh, specifically when you look at something like the MTFHR mutation, which is fairly common, 40 to 50% of Caucasians uh, have that mutation uh, that will um, cause your homocysteine to be elevated. And the elevated homocysteine is due to the inability to methylate uh, folate and B vitamins. And so supplementing these vitamins in the methylated form usually corrects it. Okay. Uh, moving on to the other markers that you mentioned for metabolic health. So we talked about hypertension and we've been addressing insulin resistance throughout because it, it is weaved into everything that causes a lot of diseases here. Um, let's talk about cholesterol. And so we mentioned, you know, the typical paradigm is that LDL is bad, HDL is good. But in the grand scheme of things, um, if I were to See if I can share this. We can. I'd just love to hear you chat. So maybe I'll ask you the question. Hear you chat a little bit about what is the conventional understanding, and then why do you lean towards not focusing on LDL as much, um, and why HDL and triglycerides are very important. And also, if you want to bring in, mention ApoB, and I'll bring in some of those that research graphic we saw at the beginning. Yeah. So I think, you know, the conventional view around cardiovascular disease prevention uh, has been overly uh, and narrowly focused on LDL cholesterol. Um, You know, now maybe ApoB has replaced LDL as the marker, uh, but it's still um, suffering in my mind from the same issue in that we're looking at the amount of cholesterol uh, the amount of these cholesterol particles, uh, cholesterol carrying particles in our bloodstream. And we're kind of assuming that all of them are the same and that they're all bad. And the reality of the situation is um, that it's really not the amount of your LDL cholesterol that's the problem. It's the quality of your LDL cholesterol. And it's the environment that that LDL cholesterol uh, and or ApoB uh, exists in. Um, mm. The other issue that we see, and you know, the figure that you have up on the screen is just one example uh, of this, is that the relative risk of LDL cholesterol or ApoB um, turns out to be much less than the relative risk that we see associated with insulin resistance. And uh, if you go, yeah, that figure uh, there, well, you know, that figure shows metabolic syndrome and diabetes there in the middle, and then Mm -hmm. ApoB and LDL down at the bottom. And you can see that the magnitude of the risk, how far to the right of the screen those lines are, is much greater for diabetes and the metabolic syndrome than it is for ApoB or LDL cholesterol. So, um, mm-hmm. In the end, I, I you know there are two issues that I see with LDL cholesterol. Um, one is that it's just not a very high fidelity marker. Um, we see uh, 
um, that, you know, studies have shown that upwards of 75% of patients that present with, um, you know, myocardial infarctions and cardiovascular disease uh, don't have elevated LDL cholesterol levels. And uh, certainly, you know, uh, and this has become more, um, I think, uh, focused on in the low carbohydrate community, there are plenty of people walking around with very elevated LDL cholesterol levels that don't develop cardiovascular disease and don't have evidence of cardiovascular disease. So, you know, I think even the most staunch lipidologist uh, these days has to admit that LDL is not a very good marker. ApoB is a little bit better of a marker. Uh, but ultimately, I think the, the, um, the metrics that look at LDL particle quality, so these are things like your particle size um, and maybe things like oxidized LDL measurements, um, are much better determinants of cardiovascular risk. And, you know, then we say, okay, well, what causes LDL particles to shift from large, buoyant LDL particles, which are not atherogenic, to small, dense LDL particles that are atherogenic? And again, that brings us right back to insulin resistance and inflammation. Uh, so um, let's, again, look at the root cause rather than looking at this sort of downstream metric. Uh, um, but at least if we're going to look at the downstream metric, the LDL cholesterol, ApoB, let's look at the right component of it. And we need to admit that, you know, on a population level, elevated LDL cholesterol is a problem because, as I said earlier, most of the population is not metabolically healthy and is insulin resistant. Um, but there are certain, mm -hmm. certainly scenarios where elevated LDL cholesterol is not problematic. And I think we need to do a better job of figuring out which of those scenarios, um, you know, the patient in front of us is in. Uh, because, you know, we end up missing things on the other side as well. There are patients walking around with low LDL cholesterol, but it's mostly poor quality LDL cholesterol, and they are still certainly at risk for cardiovascular disease. And, um, you know, this is the uh, sort of um, paradox that we see um, where, you know, patients that are on lipid lowering medications still end up developing cardiovascular disease. And again, I believe that's because we've missed the insulin resistance and we've missed the fact that they have lesser amounts, but still poor quality LDL cholesterol particles that are problematic. Right. And is there ever, is there a patient population that comes to mind that maybe you would say, you know what, they would benefit from lowering their LDL? Yeah, I, I freely admit that if a patient is insulin resistant, if they have inflammation and they have an elevated LDL cholesterol, and they're not going to do what needs to be done to address the insulin resistance and the inflammation, then lowering their LDL cholesterol does have some benefit. Uh, that benefit okay. is nowhere near as large as um, we've been led to believe it is, um, but there is some benefit in that situation. I would much rather that patient address their insulin resistance and reverse it and, you know, address the inflammation and reverse it and get to the situation where, you know, the LDL is no longer problematic. But if they're not willing to do that, then certainly, you know, using pharmacotherapy to lower their LDL cholesterol is going to have some benefit. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about right now is primarily primary prevention, right? Like even preventing the first onset of any sign of cardiovascular disease. Um, would you say that for secondary prevention, there is more of a benefit for a decrease in that LDL if they don't make those lifestyle changes as well? Yeah, there is more of a benefit in secondary prevention. But again, the same thing applies to secondary prevention. You know, the, if patients yeah. are in a secondary prevention situation and they are willing to, you know, and, and are successful in reversing insulin resistance, lowering their inflammation, I think we can also get them into a situation where there really isn't any benefit 
uh, to lowering LDL cholesterol. Um, and again, I know that's, uh, yeah. n- I know that's very controversial, uh, but you know, that figure that you have up right there kind of tells the story that very narrow sliver yeah. of LDL small P, uh, which are your, you know, atherogenic damaged, small, dense LDL particles. And I would throw in, you know, VLDL with that and lipoprotein A, uh, but it's a very small sliver and it, we correct the, all the rest of it. It's not really clear that they're still, uh, you know, most of those patients, once you correct their metabolic syndrome, correct their insulin resistance, correct their high inflammation markers, they no longer even have uh, very prominent levels of small LDL. They might end up with a lot of large LDL. And, you know, that's the situation where we're really trying to understand, is that problematic or not? And there are studies Mm -hmm. that are underway uh, to determine that. But, you know, again, when you look at that figure there near the top, they have large LDL particles and you can see that there's no significance uh, to uh, risk with large LDL particles. Okay. Yeah. And the reason I ask you that is just because there's a lot of nuance and uh, I do have medical colleagues that watch this and supervise this. So I just want to make sure I do my, my due diligence in, in clarifying a couple of uh, of those nuances. Yeah, no, and I think that's very important, and I think that speaks to the complexity of cardiovascular disease. And quite frankly, it becomes the challenge of trying to, um, you know, settle these uh, discussions, you know, on social media or even on, yeah. uh, you know, a podcast like this. The reality is, is that you know, scientists and clinicians spend their entire careers, uh, you know, unraveling this problem. And clearly, you know, 70 years into the focus on cholesterol as the uh, root cause of heart disease, we haven't figured out the answer because heart disease remains the number one killer, despite all of our efforts, uh, which have been pretty successful uh, in getting people on medications to lower their LDL cholesterol. And yet we're really not seeing the meaningful impact on the incidence of cardiovascular disease that we should be seeing if it was truly about all about LDL cholesterol. And, you know, uh, I, yeah. I think the, you know, I, I don't think it's uh, controversial to say, uh, although some would quibble with this, the reason that we focus on LDL cholesterol is because we have medications that can modulate LDL cholesterol. I believe that if we had medications that effectively reversed insulin resistance, um, all of a sudden, our focus would vastly would vastly change. Uh, but insulin resistance is something that really is largely lifestyle, diet and lifestyle influenced. And like I said, that's harder, and that's not something that the medical system is really set up to focus on. Hmm. Yeah, I know some people. I, a previous podcast that you're on, I was listening, argued that. Um, cardiac deaths have decreased, but that's primarily due to our emergency medicine uh, progression, progression, right? Not because of our dietary changes or because of the changes in, in the food pyramid, as we continue eating, well, or on a population as a whole, we're eating more processed food, more vegetable oils in that processed food, um, becoming more sedentary, so less exercise, less sun exposure. Like there's so many factors to consider. Yeah, we have gotten better at keeping people with heart disease alive longer. Um, You know, between the stents, the surgeries, the medications, we can keep you alive longer with heart disease, but we have had no impact on the incidence of heart disease. And, um, you know, it continues to be our number one killer. And, you know, yes, uh, there were some reductions in the death rate from cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, kind of going from about uh, 1990 to about 2010 here in the U.S., and that is largely attributable to the reduction in smoking during that time period. Smoking is obviously another major risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease um, outside of, uh, you know, insulin resistance at least. Uh, but smoking obviously causes the mm-hmm. inflammation, the cardiovas- the, the vascular inflammation. Um, which is another part of this pathway. And when you take out the effects of reduced smoking, uh, 
uh, again, there is you you can't demonstrate an improvement in cardiovascular disease uh, during this lipid centric uh, uh, era that we have been in since the you know mid nineteen eighties. Mm-hmm. And so, from my understanding so far from our our conversation and previous learning, um, it seems like in order for there to be plaque buildup, which is a typical cause of you know cardiac issues um you need some sort of inflammation to occur and then in the pre and then because of that inflammation because of that damage then cholesterol gets brought in to cause healing but then it gets stuck at the scene and typically gets blamed for being the cause but cholesterol is not the cause it's just part of that emergency scenario and so if we remove inflammation by improving our, our diet and lifestyle, exercising, getting good sleep, decreasing our stress, and we significantly decrease the, the chances of that um, tissue damage and plaque buildup. Does that sound correct? And then there's also uh, more theories and research about um, clotting factors being a part of the problem as well. Yeah, correct. Um, you know, and and I would maybe broaden it a little bit and say, you know, beyond inflammation, I would just say, you know, damage to the blood vessel wall. And yes, inflammation is probably the primary uh, thing there, uh, but there are some other issues, you know. So for instance, one of the reasons that it is believed that hypertension, high blood pressure, um, you know, increases your risk of cardiovascular disease is because of that sort of mechanical stress uh, that's placed on the blood yeah. vessel wall. Uh, so, um, you know, I would broaden that a little bit, but very much so. And so, you know, again, we have two approaches that kind of come from that. You know, there's the approach that we've been taking that you can try and eliminate cholesterol from the system, uh, it, you know, and, and the evolution in that that we've seen over the years is, you know, that we need to have lower and lower levels of cholesterol uh, to accomplish uh, that risk reduction. Or you can take the approach, well, if we just don't damage the blood vessel wall in the first place, then, you know, LDL cholesterol in and of itself is not causative. No one has ever demonstrated that in and of itself, in the absence of damage to the blood vessel wall, cholesterol, um, you know, can initiate and this process of atherosclerosis of cardio, of, uh, you know, cardiovascular plaque formation. Yeah, a question about that. What do you say when people bring up, um, I get studies about people who have a congenital mutation, like just a, a mutation that removes cholesterol from their system, and then they tend to have less or no cardiac outcomes? Yeah, so uh, really, that's been the focus on uh, PCSK9, uh, and of course, we now have you know this is where the pharmacotherapy followed the sort of genetics. They noticed that people that had mutations in their mm. PCSK9 protein, and so that they basically made very low levels or no PCSK9, um, had lower incidence of cardiovascular disease, uh, and that then led to the pharmaceutical discovery, and you know. Perhaps um, that is true. You know, if from birth uh, you have very low levels of, of cholesterol, you're going to be able to avoid cardiovascular disease. Um, but, you know, from a practical standpoint, we can't replicate that with a medication. Uh, we're not going to take, yeah. you know, babies and start giving them PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, although there is a drug under development. Uh, that is, you know, targeting, uh, essentially doing, causing that genetic knockout. Um, but we also have to recognize that LDL cholesterol plays other important roles in our body. Um, LDL cholesterol is an important component of the immune system. LDL cholesterol is a precursor for many of our sex hormones. Um, LDL cholesterol makes up all of our, you know, is a component of cell walls and, um, you know, of our brain. Uh, so I have concerns about what the um, off-target effects will be uh, 
uh, from lowering LDL mm. cholesterol levels so severely, especially if you do that early in life. Uh, and we're now talking about, you know, teenagers and 20 year olds starting these medications because, again, we're seeing 30 year olds that are developing significant atherosclerotic disease. You know, when I started my career and I was going through my training 20 years ago, um, it was basically unheard of to have a 40 year old. It was rare to have a 50 year old on my table. And, you know, we were largely operating on 70 and 80 year olds. Today, I routinely operate on 40 year olds. And it's not that unusual that I'm operating on a 30 year old now. And again, um, you know, uh, I believe that's because we're seeing insulin resistance and metabolic disease that's showing up in teenagers and preteens. Um, we now have, you know, nine and 10 year olds being diagnosed with type two diabetes, which was absolutely unheard of, yeah. uh, you know, in the past. So of course we're accelerating this time course. And I, I just don't think that the LDL approach is going to be adequate to deal with this problem. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing the, the positive roles that LDL has. I think we spend so much time debating if it's good or bad and highlighting the bad parts. But we have to remember like a God created our bodies and put specific hormones and cholesterol and things to, to help us function. He's not, uh, our body's not made in such a way that we are born with a toxin, right? And so you have to remember, yep. okay, we can decrease something, but at, at what cost? And so I appreciate you sharing that. One yeah, of the I think, other, uh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to dig into that a little bit more because one of the concerning things that we've now seen with the trials of the PCSK9 inhibitors is that they don't seem to affect all cause mortality. And in fact, you know, there uh, some of the trials suggest that they may be actually increasing all-cause mortality. So yes, you may lower mm. cardiovascular mortality, but at what cost? What other issues are we causing uh, with that severe lowering of uh, LDL cholesterol levels? Okay, we discussed. We've been discussing these biomarkers, so we can have our LDL, uh, our lipid panel. We can have our uh, fasting insulin, fasting glucose, um, but then there's other tests we can do like NMR, right, to get the particle count to see if it's a large LDL, small LDL. And then there's another test that we haven't discussed, but I think is important to touch on about the CAC score. Would you be able to elaborate on the pros of it and the cons as well? Maybe things that it might miss and when maybe you would recommend someone like me, a family physician, to recommend a patient of mine to get it? Because I would love to get a little bit more clarification on, on that score. Yeah, definitely. And I think this is another important and uh, very underutilized test. So the coronary artery calcium scan, um, it's a simple to do test. It's a CAT scan. Just lay down on the scanner table. Uh, you don't need dye. They don't need to put an IV in you literally takes five minutes to do the scan. And, um, you know, it, it's a, it can be done fairly inexpensively. Here in the U.S., um, where it's largely not covered by insurance, but the out-of-pocket cost averages around $100 uh, to get a CAC scan done. And what it shows you is whether or not there is calcium in the arteries of your heart. Calcium is one of the components of the plaque that builds up. And it's easy to see on imaging. So that's why we kind of focus on the calcified plaque. Um, I kind of view this, you know, the analogy is sort of like the mammogram for the heart. Um, we can detect cardiovascular disease at its very early stages. And that gives us an opportunity to intervene at an early stage. And the earlier you intervene, um, in any disease process, the better the outcomes are going to be. So, um, it, you know, I really advocate that this scan should be done a lot more, you know, a lot, it, it's, you should be a lot more widespread. Um, I really recommend mm -hmm. it for basically anyone over 40. Uh, and there may even be reasons to get it under 40 years old. If you think you're at particular risk. The thing to understand about it is its predictive power um, increases with age. So the older you are, 
Um, if you have a zero score, you have no calcium in your arteries, um, the better predictor that is of avoiding future events. Um, I think its utility in young people is if you have a non-zero score, even if it's a very low, you know, single digit or double digit score, and you're in your 30s, that's a major warning sign because you've already started this process of plaque formation. And um, again, that should really get you focused on controlling the modifiable risk factors. And I would put diet and lifestyle and insulin resistance at the top of that list. Uh, so I am a big advocate for these scans. I think, you know, it, not that I think the data clearly shows they are much more powerful predictors than, you know, again, some of these blood metrics like LDL cholesterol and ApoB. Um, and, you know, so I think they should be a very important component of our um, algorithm when we're figuring out who's at risk for cardiovascular disease, where someone lies in this process of the cardiovascular disease continuum. Mm, yeah, I appreciate sharing that. And with the, the CAC score, it sees the, the calcified plaques, but if somebody does, has like a soft plaque, it won't pick that up. Is that correct? That is correct. We do not see soft plaque on um, coronary artery calcium scans. Um, typically, you know, if you have calcified plaque, you are going to have some soft plaque associated with it. Um, controversial, you know, whether or not if you don't have any calcified plaque, uh, whether you can have enough soft plaque to be of concern. You certainly can have some soft plaque in the absence of calcified plaque, but, um, you know, again, controversial as to what role that actually plays. And in an ideal world, mm -hmm. we would use the more advanced scan, which is called a, a cardiac CT angiogram. Um, the, the downside of the CT angiogram is that it involves more radiation. Uh, you need to give people intravenous contrast to do those scans. They're more expensive. Uh, so I don't use them as my screening test, but certainly yeah. if I get a coronary artery calcium scan on someone and they have significant amounts of calcium, uh, you know, I may then get a CT angiogram uh, because it gives us better fidelity information. We can actually see soft plaque and calcified plaque. We can determine degree of narrowing, degree of stenosis with a CT angiogram. Uh, we can even, with the most advanced CT angiograms today, uh, look at other plaque characteristics to help us determine whether or not these may be what we call unstable plaques that are putting the patient at imminent risk of a cardiovascular event. And we can actually even measure some flow dynamics based off these scans these days to determine, you know, if mm. a stenosis is in fact significant or not. Uh, so, um, you know, the CAC scan is the basic screening test. Uh, it's certainly mm. not the definitive test, but I think it is a much better screening test to help us determine who's at risk of cardiovascular disease. Yeah. And I know here in Canada, if people want to get one, they can obviously discuss it with their family doctors and they can make that referral. Uh, they may or may not do it. I know that up until a couple months ago or weeks ago, it wasn't a guideline that for somebody that doesn't have any cardiac disease can have a CAC score done as just kind of like the first screening if they're above the age of 40 or 50. But then um, a new review or guideline was released where they didn't encourage it as much. So it's up to your conversation with your family doctor and feel free to find the research printed out and, and have a, a discussion um, because ultimately it is up to, to you to make those choices and it's a teamwork. Um, if somebody has, I mean, in your clinical experience, if you have you ever seen a patient that has like a higher CAC score, then they implement some diet, the lifestyle changes and that CAC score improves. I'm just trying to get at, is there anything that people can do to decrease that um, plaque buildup? Yeah. So again, the data that we have shows that, you know, your absolute score is a predictor, uh, but your progression over time is another uh, component of predicting cardiovascular risk. And we know that patients that have elevated CAC scores uh, that don't progress over time, 
um, are at low risk for subsequent events. Uh, and the average rate of progression in the studies that have looked at this is somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent per year range. Um, so if we can get patients not to, to progress less than that, you know, 5 percent or even, you know, no progression, we know that we are now lowering their risk for a subsequent event. Um, in my practice, I have seen patients that have lowered CAC scores. Um, the lowering is, you know, in the 10 to 15 percent range, um, but compared to a 10 to 15 percent expected increase, you know, I think that's a, a very significant difference. And, you know, those patients so far are doing very well. Um, um, you know, we um, uh, we don't have the larger studies to show this as of yet. Uh, I, I certainly wish we had more data around this. Um, again, when I look at the data that we do have, one of the problematic pieces of data that I look at is that statins, patients that are on statins, uh, have been shown to have um, really uh, increased amounts of calcification. And, you know, there's this hypothesis that has been put forward uh, that the statin is converting soft plaque to calcified plaque and therefore stabilizing that plaque. And so that that is actually a good thing. Um, but I have a hard time uh, reconciling that data with the fact that we know that the higher your coronary calcium score is, the more at risk you are of a cardiovascular event. So this kind right. of uh, circuitous thinking that, you know, elevated coronary calcium scores in someone that's on a statin is not problematic, but someone that's not on a statin, it is problematic, you know, gives me uh, gives me uh, a little bit of agita trying to reconcile that. Um, and so um, I, you know, again, I think, and I have now demonstrated with my patients that we should be focused on slowing the progression and ideally reversing coronary calcification. It is possible. And uh, again, diet and lifestyle, I think, are playing a major role in that uh, by reversing the insulin resistance and the inflammation that's driving this process. Yeah. Okay. And since we're talking about statins, would you mind chatting a little bit about um, the indications and where maybe you would recommend it to patients? And I would love to hear a little bit of your spiel when you're talking with patients in terms of informed consent, because I would love to almost have like a, a template I can go through with patients to discuss, to say like, hey, this is what it does. In these circumstances, in primary prevention, secondary, this is the absolute risk reduction, et cetera. Um, love to hear what you tell your patients. Yeah, so I think those are some key components of the conversation. You know, really understanding the benefits of these medications as the trials have shown us. And um, that discussion, I think, really needs to focus on um, absolute risk reduction as opposed to the relative risk reduction that the pharmaceutical companies love to promote. Because, you know, when you look in the primary prevention setting, um, on average, you know, people taking statins um, have an absolute risk reduction somewhere in the one to, you know, maybe 1.4% range, um, you know, uh, but that gets turned into an absolute risk reduction of 40 to 50%, um, which of course sounds a lot more um, impressive. Um, and we oh, need just, to balance you that mean rel against, relative or relative for the 40 percent. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, that needs to get balanced against the side effects, the potential risks of these medications, which, again, the pharmaceutical company will always tell you the absolute risk of side effects. They don't tell you the relative risk. Uh, increase in side effects from taking these medications. And, you know, quite frankly, the side effects that I am most concerned about when it comes to statin medications is over the long term, they have now been clearly demonstrated to increase the risk of developing insulin resistance. The very thing that we just said we're mm. trying to avoid. 
um, and in increasing the risk of type 2 diabetes uh, with long-term use of these medications. Uh, and then there are some concerning data around uh, memory loss, you know, neurologic conditions, uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, with the long-term use of these medications. And again, we need to understand that, you know, we're only really starting to get that data uh, because we've now been using these medications for, you know, there are patients that have now been on these medications for decades. And so we're starting to see these effects that understandably you can't see maybe in the short-term trials that are used uh, to approve these, although there were some concerning signals when you go back through some of that data. So um, that's the discussion I have. And again, the discussion I have with my patients is taking these medications is one approach. Um, and if you choose not to take that approach, it doesn't mean that you're ignoring your cardiovascular disease. Um, we're just choosing to take a different approach by focusing on insulin resistance, inflammation, diet and lifestyle, and trying to get you, the patient in front of me, to a point where we can now be comfortable in saying your LDL cholesterol really isn't a risk factor anymore because we've taken care of the insulin resistance, we've taken care of the inflammation, you have large, you know, non atherogenic LDL particles. And it's no longer a risk factor for you, so there's no need for this medication. Mm, okay. Thanks for sharing that. So statins. Yeah, and that's something that I try to discuss with with my patients. Everything that you covered there, and how can you remember the specific study that talks about statins increasing insulin resistance? Um, I don't expect you to remember because there's probably so many papers that you've read. Um, yeah, so there now have actually been multiple meta-analyses looking at this. And, and yeah, I don't remember the uh, citations offhand, uh, but we now have multiple meta-analyses uh, looking at statin trials and long-term statin use that have demonstrated this increase in type 2 diabetes uh, and insulin resistance in patients who are on uh, statins. Um, it seems to be more I will note that it really seems to be isolated to statins. Um, it hasn't okay. yet been demonstrated to be an effect of other lipid lowering medications. So you look at things like uh, bempedoic acid, zetamide, uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, now, again, these medications haven't been in use for as long a period, um, but it may be uh, specifically related to, you know, the mechanism that statins work by, which is different than the mechanisms that these other medications work by to lower cholesterol. Uh, so to be clear, I, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be an effect of lowered cholesterol levels. It seems to be unique to statins, and it probably has to do with the okay. mitochondrial effects that statins have uh, that some of these other lipid-lowering medications do not have. So that okay. adds another component to the discussion, uh, quite frankly, of, okay, maybe there are patients that lipid lowering is beneficial, um, but maybe statins aren't the best way to accomplish that. Uh, and that's, a, that's an evolving discussion that has to do with these newer classes of medications. There are other considerations. You know, these newer classes are much more expensive, uh, is a major factor uh, in that discussion. but. Uh, that's something that we're still, quite frankly, unraveling. Okay. And so if, just to summarize, for primary prevention, the uh, absolute risk reduction of a statin is 1 to 1.4%, so le less than 2%. But yeah. what it's sold as is the relative risk reduction of 40 to 50% risk reduction. So that sounds a lot better. And that's what I also see in our guidelines when I recently read it. And then some of the the side effects can include increased insulin resistance, and memory issues, Alzheimer's disease, muscle aches, and, and so on. Would you happen to know some of the numbers like absolute risk reduction and relative risk for secondary prevention? Um, yeah, so they are uh, more robust. Uh, I believe you know the absolute risk reductions that we see on average for secondary prevention are somewhere in the four to eight percent range. Uh, 
uh, you know, depending on the study and, and what exact population you're looking at. Uh, but they're certainly more robust. Um, and, um, you know, like we said earlier, I think a situation, you know, I think the best argument for, for lipid lowering can be made in patients who are in a secondary prevention uh, situation who, again, have insulin resistance and inflammation that either they're not willing to or we're unable to effectively, um, you know, uh, manage and treat. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. All right. So we've we talked a lot about cholesterol, LDL, um, statins and such. So I think it'd be good to transition to look talking about specific dietary choices and um, maybe touching upon why a low fat diet might not be the best for heart health or just op optimal health. I'd love for you to chat give me your opinion on the Mediterranean diet, which I, a lot of people, you know, has the most amount of evidence. Therefore, a lot of people kind of push that and, and want to bring that up. And um, we can go from there, but I'd love to hear your opinions too, because I know that you're, you're open to people eating the carnivore, vegan, vegetarian, as long as they're not living in a deficiency, right? As long as they can meet the nutritional requirements, then you're down for them to to live their life and make those choices. So um, would you be able to, to, to chat about that? Yeah. So I, I think really the first principle here and, uh, the, you know, the thing that people need to be paying attention to is, uh, the r elimination, um, ideally certainly the reduction in processed food. Um, it's very clear now that ultra processed food, um, which, you know, has a number of concerning components to it, uh, is the problematic thing in our diet. And the unfortunate reality, again, is that in the Western diet, um, ultra-processed food dominates. Um, when you walk into the grocery store, you know, 90% of what you're looking at is ultra-processed food. And, um, you know, we've now, and, and the studies show on population levels in the Western world, um, ultra-processed food account for upwards of 80% uh, percent of our caloric intake. So, um, my first mm. principle is eliminate ultra processed food. Now that leaves you with eating, you know, whole real food, eating what I say are the things that grow in the ground and the things that eat the things that grow in the ground, basically plants and animals. And the balance of that is then I think up for um, debate and, you know, is going to depend on someone's personal preferences. Uh, so certainly, um, you know, plant based. Vegan diets have shown benefits when compared to Western diets. Um, I believe, and you know, we have uh, accumulating evidence. Um, although we also have historical evidence that we can uh, maybe talk about a little bit, showing that animal-based diets, um, in a similar manner, you know, uh, have uh, can lead to improvements in health metrics. You know, is one better than the other? Um, I, I think it depends on what context you're looking at. You know, uh, the one thing that I kind of look at is um, animal protein, animal products provide all of the essential nutrients that we need. Um, you know, the essential fats, the essential vitamins and minerals, uh, the essential amino acids. Plant products by themselves cannot provide all of the essential nutrients, amino acids that we need. So if you're on a purely plant-based diet, it is mandatory to supplement. And, you know, the, the, the vegans don't, don't uh, uh, deny that. Um, they just say that, okay, we have to take some supplements. And like I said, I, I, I've worked with some patients who choose to take that approach. I don't consider it ideal. I will, you know, disclose, I guess, my bias that I have been on a carnivore diet now for the past four years low carb keto for, uh, you know, uh, uh, three or four additional years before that. Uh, and I believe that an animal based approach is the optimal human diet. Um, but, uh, like I said, I don't, that doesn't mean that I tell all of my patients that you absolutely need to be a carnivore. Um, I work with patients on the whole spectrum of whole real food diets. Now, you know, the Mediterranean mm -hmm. diet is a very interesting example of 
how we evaluate nutrition. So there are some things that come up when you're talking about the Mediterranean diet. And yes, I'll admit that the Mediterranean diet probably has been the best studied diet. Um, and it certainly has shown improvements when comparing it to a Western diet. Um, uh, but, you know, we have to kind of step back and say, well, what exactly is the Mediterranean diet? Because, um, you know, when you really look at these, the, you know, the populations in the Mediterranean region, you see large variations in the diet that they eat. Uh, but the, the kind of medical Mediterranean diet, I guess you could say, the one that sort of gets studied and promoted, um, you know, emphasizes the use of olive oil, uh, emphasizes, uh, you know, fresh, you know, whole uh, vegetables, um, tends to minimize uh, red meat consumption, especially saturated fat. Although, again, when you really go to these countries in the Mediterranean region, many of them are not adhering to that. Uh, and, you know, probably has a moderate amount of grains uh, typically in the diet. And I think depending on your context, that may or may not work for you. Uh, the bottom line is, is mm -hmm. you're insulin resistant. You are intolerant of carbohydrates. And the most effective way to reverse insulin resistance is with the elimination of carbohydrates or the restriction of carbohydrates, uh, a therapeutic carbohydrate restrictive diet. Um, is, I believe, the best way to refer to it these days. And so um, a Mediterranean diet may end up being too high carb uh, for you. Uh, and, you know, so that's where some of the context comes in. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think that olive oil is harmful to our health. Uh, I think it's certainly yeah. uh, a better option than polyunsaturated, you know, seed oils. Uh, and I don't have problems, uh, with people who, you know, say, okay, I want to take sort of a Mediterranean approach and we figure out what that, you know, what that looks like, how that works again for the person in front of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find myself, I'm, I'm totally okay with people eating vegetables and, and fruits given they're metabolically healthy. One of the things that I, I find myself doing, uh, talking with patients is just encouraging them that it's okay to eat meat that they don't have to be afraid of it i'm not yeah. pushing people to eat carnivore that's a big change and one that you just have to make that that choice for yourself but i find a lot of people are still afraid of eating meat specifically red meat but they'll eat chicken or whatever else um and so that's the 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 battle the small little battle that i, I kind of fight um, it's just educating patients that, you know, it's okay. You can eat red meat. You don't have to eat it like once a year or, or never. It's not exactly. going to kill you. Yeah, no, that's very largely, uh, you know, the discussions I have with people as well. Red meat has been falsely villainized, you know, as a negative component of our diet. Um, and now I believe we have, you know, ample evidence that, you know, red meat, in and of itself is not harmful. Uh, you know, unfortunately, again, in the Western world, this has been confounded by the fact that when people say they eat red meat, we're oftentimes referring to something like a hamburger, where they're going to have toppings, they're going to have the bun, they're going to have the French fries with it, and they're going to drink the soda with it. And that then gets turned mm -hmm. into the red meat is bad. Um, when in fact, it's not. And when you look at red meat in isolation, um, you can't demonstrate and it hasn't been demonstrated that it's bad. Uh, and we have the evolutionary record here. We have been eating red meat for our entire existence as human beings. Um, and to somehow believe that in the past 150 years, red meat all of a sudden became the problem causing all this chronic disease really doesn't make sense. And even more so, when you look at the past 50 years, for instance, the past 70 years, um, the consumption of red meat, again, here in the US, I believe the Canadian statistics are, are largely the same. The consumption of red meat per capita has gone down something like 30 to 40% over the past 70 years, while the incidence of all these chronic diseases like diabetes, you know, uh, heart disease, 
Alzheimer's disease have increased during that time, increased very significantly during that time. So how yeah. can red meat be the problem when, you know, the the incidence of the disease is moving opposite the direction of the consumption? Uh, so I agree with you. That is a central message that I give to patients as well, that you don't need to fear eating red meat. And I do believe it can be a very important and very beneficial part of our dietary strategy. Yeah. Interesting how there's um, no correlation, therefore no causation, yet we still hear that red meat causes cancer, diabetes, <laughs> and so on. Um, but I appreciate you sharing some of that, the statistics there that consumption has gone down, yet the metabolic diseases have gone up. One, one thing that you mentioned before was that uh, historical, like we have some historical evidence of the benefits uh, that we've been eating uh, red meat. What, what comes to mind or is that what you just shared um, previously? Yeah, well, we can go back to uh, some of the literature, uh, you know, from the late 1800s, early 1900s uh, and prominent physicians uh, like, uh, Banting, uh, who, you know, uh, their preferred treatment, uh, for a condition, uh, like diabetes, um, you know, uh, was a meat heavy, low carbohydrate diet back then. They didn't have, you know, the medications that we have available to us today. They didn't have insulin. Uh, and so, the only way to treat uh, diabetes back then was by restricting carbohydrates. Uh, and so, um, and we, you know, uh, that was done successfully and safely. Uh, so, um, you know, it, the, the ironic kind of situation we find ourselves in is um, the low, you know, the, the low fat processed Western diet was introduced and promulgated. Uh, you know, over the past 50 or 60 years. And um, clearly our health has worsened during that time. And yet we're now in a situation where when you make a suggestion of going against that diet, um, the baseline assumption is that you have to prove, um, you know, that uh, that diet, which clearly hasn't worked, um, is, you know, not a good diet. And anything else that you're suggesting is considered a fad diet, a new suggestion, even though, you know, the animal based diet that I talk about was our default diet as human beings up until the last 50 years, essentially, you know, the last mm -hmm. 70 years. Uh, and even when you look at something like a vegan diet, you know, a, a, a purely vegan diet was absolutely not feasible. Uh, you know, prior to 100 years ago, because we didn't have the supplements that you need to be able to survive on that dietary approach. Um, but yet, you know, we're now in this backward situation where I have to kind of, you know, myself and the practitioners like me get challenged to kind of uh, disprove something that was never proven in the first place. The reality of the yeah. situation is the Western diet is yeah. the fad experimental diet. And that experiment has failed uh, spectacularly, uh, you know, uh, and really, you know, any study you look at shows that the more that you eat processed food, uh, the worse your health is going to be. Uh, and so um, that, I think, is the, um, is the default uh, that we should be working from. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not. We're now in a situation where you say something like, you know, eat whole real food. And that becomes controversial because you're talking about incorporating animal products, quite frankly. Um, if you yeah. just say, um, you know, it, 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 it's funny because I talk to my patients about how to interact with some of their other doctors. And I tell them that if you just go and say, I'm eating a whole real food diet, doctors are going to say, great. Um, but if you tell them you're eating a carnivore diet, they're going to lose their minds and, and say you're killing yourself. Uh, despite the evidence in front of them, you know, we were, we've reversed your diabetes. We reversed your high blood pressure. You lost all this weight, you know, and, um, you know, 
the vast majority of your cardiovascular markers show improvement. Uh, but because you say you're eating a lot of red meat and maybe because your LDL cholesterol has gone up, uh, most doctors are going to, you know, uh, try and discourage you from doing what has led to all that improvement. And that's the very problematic situation that I see with my patients these days. Yeah. Um, st staying on the topic of the diet, do you find um, fiber to be beneficial at all? No, I really don't. Um, you know, uh, well, I, I, again, I guess it, it, could, it depends what you're comparing it to, um, because yeah. the studies uh, have basically shown that when you substitute, uh, when you increase fiber and decrease your processed food consumption or your consumption of sugar uh, and highly refined carbohydrates, you show improvement. Um, but that doesn't mean that fiber is essential or is really beneficial. It's really just the subtraction of these other things that you're substituting the fiber for. And it's interesting, you know, uh, fiber uh, certainly probably has its, its most, uh, you know, it, it most often gets bought up in the context, first of all, of uh, bowel uh, regularity uh, and, um, you know, its relationship to um, uh, colorectal cancer and, you know, cardiovascular disease. So, you know, there was one randomized controlled trial that I'm aware of that looked at um, increased fiber uh, in the setting of idiopathic constipation. And that study uh, showed that the group that got increased fiber, fiber supplementation, um, had worse constipation. And the group that, you know, eliminated, lowered their fiber intake, uh, actually had improve, improvement in their constipation. Uh, so, you know, very interesting. Um, the data, you know, yeah. for fiber and cardiovascular disease, again, shows that if you're increasing fiber and reducing processed food and sugar intake, you show improvement in cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, but I'm not aware of any studies that show that increased fiber in the absence of those things uh, improve uh, any of these outcomes we're talking about. And then again, this is some this is a situation where I now you know need to turn because we don't have the great randomized control trials. So I turn to the you know the experiences of my patients in the community around me who are implementing carnivore diets, which are deficient in fiber. And yet they continue to have regular bowel movements and, you know, all of these metrics of health, uh, like, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, insulin resistance, weight, all of these things are improving in these people. And, um, I am not seeing an increase in cardiovascular problems, uh, in my patients or in this right. community. So, um, I admit that, you know, I'd love to have better data. I'd love to have the randomized controlled trials on this. Um, but, you know, we're not there yet. And uh, so uh, we need to, you know, it, uh, again, you know, uh, collective experiences, case studies, um, these are data that we do need to take into account. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I'm sure the, re the research will come. I know that Sean Baker with Rivero is trying to um, bring up some some studies and hopefully that those would be beneficial i'm curious to know in your experience when you deal with patients who go from let's say a pure western diet and they go to a, either a carnivore or just like a keto kind of diet just low carb do you know what's the fastest timeline you've seen them like reverse type 2 diabetes or just like improve a whole bunch of uh, markers yeah, so I, I've certainly seen significant improvements within three months. Um, even at six weeks, actually, uh, Rob Syphus has demonstrated that you can uh, uh, demonstrate reversal of fatty liver disease markers. Uh, so, um, you know, these effects can happen very quickly. Um, of course, it's going to depend on, you know, where you're starting from, how long, you know, you've had these conditions. Um, but, 
um, we do see dramatic improvements uh, very quickly with these diets. And when we're we're looking at uh, medication um, cessation, um, you know, it's often within the first couple of weeks of starting these diets that I need to take patients off their blood pressure medications because their blood pressure is getting too low, or I need to take them off uh, their diabetic medications because their blood sugars are getting too low. Uh, and so um, th- some of these changes happen very quickly, and they happen even before the weight loss occurs in many patients. Okay. So if somebody is going to make decide to change their life around, definitely do it with a, a doctor um, that can kind of monitor some of those metrics so that you don't go too low sugar or blood pressure. Yeah, if you're on medications uh, and you're considering these dietary changes, I think it is very important to be working with a practitioner who uh, understands this, can help you monitor it. Um, this brings up, you know, the use of things like continuous glucose monitors uh, that, again, I think are are fabulous tools uh, for helping patients through this process. And um, you know, again, it's uh, it's unfortunate that uh, sometimes cost considerations. Uh, you know, get in the way yeah. of using these tools. Uh, but I would like to see these tools more widely available to people. Mm-hmm. All right. So moving on, uh, we talked, uh, I think we did a good conversation about diets here. Actually, one thing I did want to hear your opinion on is so the the low fat diet. Just why why do you think it doesn't work because I have talked with um, previous like other doctors I've worked with that really push a low fat diet, specifically a general surgeon. So her th- their context is you know gall- gallbladder issues, and so they push a lot of fiber, a lot of or in low fat diet, low meat, complex carbs, and I that's the complete opposite of what we're discussing right now, right? Um, and so love to hear your your take on that uh, briefly. Yeah, and, and and quite frankly, I would I would put it to those practitioners to really evaluate the results that their patients are getting from it, because uh, I suspect if they looked at it carefully, they would realize that the results aren't very good. Um, you know, there are there are two fundamental problems that I see with a low fat diet. Number one, by necessity, um, you need to you know, consume increased amounts of processed food. Because if you're taking fat out, first of all, it involves processing the food to get the fat out. And now you need to substitute something for the fat. And that invariably ends up being sugar and carbohydrates. Um, So we're increasing processed food consumption, which again, study after study show that that is associated with negative health outcomes. The other is, quite frankly, the palatability and the, and the um, sustainability of that diet. And it is not good at all. You know, patients have very tough times adhering to low-fat diets. And again, I can draw on my personal experience. There were many times that I attempted a low-fat diet. And in the short term, you know, I could lose some weight uh, and, you know, have some success, but I could not maintain it. And I don't think it's because of, you know, my willpower, because I'm Mm -hmm. able to easily maintain my low carbohydrate carnivore approach. Um, And, you know, fat is essential to the human diet. Um, We we all know about the fat soluble vitamins that are essential. uh, And, you know, you can't live without fat and too low of fat is problematic. And I, I just, it's not a sustainable diet. And it is not a beneficial diet. Uh, And I I think the fact that we're still continuing to recommend it, despite all the evidence in front of us, again, you know, we have been recommending low fat diets here in the United States since 1980 is when the first version of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines came out recommending a low fat diet. Even before that, you know, there were uh, recommendations from societies uh, like the American Heart Association on reducing fat intake. And um, it's simply not working. And we can sit here as the medical system and blame the patient and say, well, it's because they're not adhering to it. Uh, But again, the reason that they're not adhering to it is because it's not a sustainable diet um, that humans can maintain. 
Uh, and so uh, th 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 those are the problems I see with the low fat diet. And again, I point to the big evidence because um, the, the dietary consumption evidence here in the United States, again, shows that fat intake, dietary fat intake has gone down, uh, you know, since these recommendations have been in place over the past 30 or 40 years. And the diseases that the low fat diet is supposed to be helping with continue to go up. Uh, so um, those are the problems that I see with it. And of course, I would also add, like I said earlier, you know, a low fat diet is by necessity going to be a high carbohydrate diet. And if you are insulin resistant, um, that is clearly not going to be beneficial to you. And uh, so uh, those would be some of the, I guess, talking points that I would uh, bring forward on a low fat diet. Yeah, no, those are very good points. Um, one thing that I want to touch on, or I guess we can move on to a different topic, but you, in your book, you have the seven principles for metabolic health, and I'll just kind of rhyme them off here. One is reframe your health as a system, not, not just a goal. Two, eat real whole food. Three, make one sustainable change at a time. Four, daily movement. Five, sleep enough six, relieve stress, and seven, partner with a health practitioner who understands metabolic health. One thing that we haven't discussed yet is that daily movement aspect. It's really important to make those nutritional mm -hmm. changes and can really pivot, that, move that needle significantly. Um, but it's also important to, to move, to build strength, to build the muscles. Would you be able to discuss that? Yeah, certainly. So I think that um, increased activity is another key component uh, that goes into improving uh, metabolic health and insulin resistance. And we especially uh, see the role of muscle uh, in improving uh, insulin resistance and uh, improving metabolic health. Um, we know, again, um, you know, the more that you're able to maintain muscle as you age, not only the longer that you'll live, but the higher quality of life that you'll have. So I do try and prioritize with my patients resistance activities, resistance exercise, um, adequate protein intake, which is another key component of this, and building and maintaining muscle. Um, okay. Increasing your activity in general, I think is very important as well. Um, and I talk to my patients, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to the gym and run on a treadmill for an hour or two a day. Um, these can be simple things like, um, you know, using a stand up desk, which I'm doing right now, uh, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, uh, you know, taking a 10 minute walk um, a couple of times a day and after you eat. Uh, these are things that have all been demonstrated to be very beneficial and very achievable. Um, you know, uh, when you start talking to patients about, you know, you need to go to the gym and be on a treadmill or the exercise bike for, you know, an hour, five times a week, um, I find that most people aren't able to sustainably integrate that into their life. And therefore, you know, it's not practical. And quite frankly, I don't think it really has demonstrated um, you know, benefit above and beyond, just get more activity in your day and focus on building some muscle. And that's going to have a uh, vast improvement uh, in your metabolic health and in reversing and improving insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know there's some studies that show if you can get eight to 9,000 steps per day, that is that sweet spot that really reduces blood pressure and has a lot of the the benefits from just low intensity exercise. Probably have to do a brisk walk, not nonchalant walk, but um, it's one of the goals I give my patients. If you can walk eight thousand steps a day, you know that's the kind of minimum you can do to to start experiencing those benefits. And you know, I try to take the stairs instead of the elevators. Like those little things, I think I want to encourage people who are listening. Think about your daily routine and where can you incorporate a little bit of exercise just throughout the day um, instead of having to make this life change of like exercising for an hour straight. 
One of the uh, other things that you mentioned is making, uh, which I kind of just discussed, is making one sustainable change at a time. What do you find uh, patients get stuck on when you make these recommendations? Is it just they become overwhelmed with uh, so many kind of factors that they have to think about? And what is the first step to usually uh, encourage them to take? Yeah, so I I, I think the noise um, certainly becomes problematic these days. Um, the you know again, most patients come to me having been bombarded with this messaging around low fat diets. Um, you know that meat is bad for their health, and so you know that takes a lot of undoing, and that leads to a lot of the confusion. Um, ultimately. I, I think that the dietary changes need to be first and foremost. You know, mm-hmm. yes, sleep is important, stress is important, activity is important. Um, but if you're not, um, you know, getting the dietary part right, you really can't overcome that with these other things. So I, I do typically emphasize to my patients that that's, you know, that's what we're going to work on first. The other benefit I find of working on that first is it tends to help the other things. Uh, so what I find is when people, um, you know, start eating whole real food, lower their carbohydrate, um, you know, eat uh, uh, adequate amounts of protein, they just naturally start getting more active because they have more energy. They start sleeping mm-hmm. better um, and they seem to be better able to manage their stress. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, the relationship that we're starting to understand between mental health and metabolic health. Uh, And I would point to the work of, uh, you know, Dr. Chris Palmer, who's at the forefront of this, but many others uh, that are clearly showing this relationship. And, you know, even people who don't have overt mental health diagnoses, um, they just report again and again, that when they, you know, reduce carbohydrates, uh, uh, you know, start eating whole real food, they just have a more stable mood, their mental clarity improves. And um, that, you know, again, becomes a self reinforcing behavior. Uh, So, you know, that helps to reinforce the dietary changes. Uh, And so Mm -hmm. I, I, I start with the diet almost always because I really do believe that that is the most powerful component of this. Okay. What we've, we've talked about quite a bit of things here and what other biomarkers I'm interested that you, do you check that go above and beyond the typical lipid panel insulin resistance? Like I just want to hear if there's any other smaller or unknown biomarkers that, that you look into when you order. Yeah. So, you know, we mentioned checking insulin levels and, um, you know, determining insulin resistance. Uh, and there are a couple of ways to do that. Um, you know, there's, uh, what's called the HOMA IR score. So H O M A hyphen I R. And that's a calculation that, uh, takes into account your blood glucose level and your, uh, insulin level, both fasted. And I think that's a helpful tool. Um, the uh, lipoprotein insulin resistance score, um, which is based off of a uh, NMR panel, you know, looking at your particle sizes, I think is another very useful metric for checking insulin, for determining insulin resistance. Um, we mentioned homocysteine levels, and I think that's very important to check. And then the other thing I would put in is uh, lipoprotein A. Uh, and we haven't touched upon that yet. Lipoprotein A is a um, type of, it, it, it is an LDL particle uh, that has this extra protein attached to it, lipoprotein A, uh, that allows that particle to then interact with the blood clotting system. And um, blood clotting is another very important component of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we haven't really gotten into that. It's a whole other topic on itself. Uh, I would point people to, um, you know, an excellent book by Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, who is a uh, GP uh, in uh, the UK. And uh, he wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago now. It's called The Clot Thickens. Uh, 
And it really is a um, comprehensive look at the role of clotting in the development of cardiovascular disease. And, and Malcolm actually hypothesizes that clotting may be the primary factor in the development of heart disease. And, you know, again, when we talked about earlier, you know, the damage to the blood vessel wall, um, you know, one of the things that activates is the blood clotting system. And so, um, you know, mm -hmm. lots of evidence to suggest that, you know, blood clotting is an important component. And we know that patients with elevated lipoprotein A levels are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So uh, that's another factor that I think is important to check on. And uh, I think if people get a comprehensive evaluation that involves those components, uh, they're going to get a pretty good sense for where they lie on the cardiovascular disease uh, continuum, cardiovascular disease risk continuum, I should say. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It, APOA is something that is not discussed much or at all. I, I don't know too much about it. So it's something that I'll definitely look into learning more about. Yeah. Li um, lipoprotein so we talked A, about different than APOA. Uh, so APOA oh, okay. is kind of, uh, you know, APOB is LDL uh, particles. APOA is really looking at HDL particles, uh, but lipoprotein A, okay. usually abbreviated LP little a, uh, is a whole separate marker. Oh, I see. Uh, that is very much under uh, appreciated. Okay, I can recognize the shorthand. It just wasn't the the long form <laughs> that, yep. I, that I didn't recognize. Okay. Um, as we wrap up, one of the questions that I like to ask my guests is, "What are three traits of someone who is unstoppable?" Yeah. So I think um, the first trait that I would point to is curiosity. Um, and, uh, always being curious, always asking, you know, what might I be wrong about? Um, I think is one of the, uh, traits that go into being unstoppable. Um, I think, uh, being mission driven is another, uh, trait that I would point to as, uh, you know, for someone that is unstoppable. And, um, the final trait I would probably say is just, um, you know, persistence, um, the, the, the willing to, the willingness to, uh, you know, some people maybe would put this as grit or toughness, you know, but the willing to, the willingness to persist in the face of adversity, uh, is, uh, I would say the three traits that I would point to for being unstoppable. Okay. Uh, curiosity, mission driven and persistence or grit. Um, those are very good traits. And as you were discussing there, um, a question came to mind that I just didn't want to miss. One of the pushbacks that people have when we discuss keto or carnivore, any diet really, is that it's unsustainable for most people. It's just too challenging, unrealistic. People give up or, yeah, well, that's, that's one of the, the main pushbacks. Do you find that's true or what's the nuance there? Why people give up? No, I really don't find that's true. Um, you know, as I said, I personally myself have now uh, seven plus years into a low carb keto carnivore approach and uh, really have no reason to think that I'm ever going to change. Uh, I have many others in the community that have been doing it for much longer times than I have. And quite frankly, I think the biggest barrier uh, to people maintaining this is the, you know, all of the, the misinformation, um, you know, uh, the fear that gets put into them, uh, about, you know, consuming large amounts of fat, consuming saturated fat, consuming red meats, um, that I find becomes the biggest barrier. Um, there is a transition period. Uh, and you know, that again needs to be managed with someone who understands it. Uh, you know, this whole thing about the keto flu, uh, largely can be avoided and abated with, you know, the right, uh, right, uh, coaching the right techniques. And that's something that my team and I do a lot with my patients. Um, but you know, once patients are on the diet, they're seeing the effects of it. I, I actually find for most people, it's very easy to maintain. Uh, because, 
they're feeling great. And, you know, they recognize that the food that they're eating is, is sustaining and improving their health. Uh, so, um, I, I, again, I find it very ironic that the, the, you know, sustainability is used as an argument against the keto diet when the promoted diet, the low fat diet, um, is clearly, clearly worse, yeah. uh, from a sustainability standpoint. And again, there have been numerous studies looking at low fat versus low carb head to head, and all of them have shown uh, low fat, low carb wins out over low fat on both sustainability and improvement in health metrics. Right. Well, uh, Dr. Ovedia, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing so much wisdom, so much knowledge. If people who are listening want to learn more about you, your book, and just like what you do, how can they contact you? Take this time to kind of pitch everything you got so that people can really become connected and learn more about this topic. Yeah. So the book, uh, it's called Stay Off My Operating Table, widely available all the usual places. Um, so I would encourage people to start there. Um, iFixHearts is where you can find me. So you can go to iFixHearts.com. Uh, come to my website, as I mentioned, free quiz right on the front page uh, that will inform you whether or not you're metabolically healthy. And you can see all the different ways that my team and I work with people. We have coaching programs, we have courses, and I have the uh, private you know, telemedicine uh, practice uh, that's available throughout the US. And I also work with people internationally. So um, that is available to people. Uh, and then on social media, I'm most active over on Twitter, again, at iFixHearts. Uh, over on Instagram, uh, just look for Ovadia Heart Health or just search my name. Thankfully, it's it's uncommon enough that it's easy to find me uh, just yeah. uh, searching by my last name. Great. Well, I think we covered a lot of topics, but I will just um, give you the opportunity. Was there anything that maybe we didn't touch on that you really wanted to mention, or do you think we covered uh, a good breadth of information? Yeah, no, I think this was a great conversation. I really enjoyed being able to go into depth on some of these things that you don't necessarily get the chance on some of the shorter podcasts. And in the end, I just want to encourage people, uh, give them hope, uh, let them know that they can take charge of their health. I think that's really a key component of this. Um, don't be passive about your health. Don't just take what, you know, uh, your doctor gives you, the insurance company gives you, the government gives you. Um, you need to be actively managing your health. And if you're working with practitioners that aren't actively working to improve your health, it's time to find different practitioners. We can do better than just trying to manage disease. You know, as I said, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, these are reversible diseases. Cardiovascular disease is preventable. So I really encourage patients to get active about their health, take charge of their health, and be encouraged that you can achieve these, you know, very impressive improvements in your health that I now am seeing routinely with the patients that I work with. Absolutely. Thank you for the encouragement for that word of advice. And on that note, um, thank you again and have a great day.